Good afternoon, everyone. I'm glad to see you here. You know, the group here in person at the conference center, and I know there's people online too. So we'll we'll gonna get started right away now because I think you've been waiting, and we've got a good program today. I'm really looking forward to it, and I hope you are also. So this is talk story. It's presented by the 1882 Foundation. I'm Stan Liu, one of the talk story directors, and we're located here in Washington, D.C. You know, we've been holding these events at least once a month since originating in 2012. We began always being live here in Washington, D.C., Chinatown, but we went virtually and online with the coronavirus and pandemic beginning in March 2020, and so until early this year, to 2023, now we are hybrid, combination live and online. And we are live streaming. So those of you who are on, watching uh, on Zoom, if you're you know uncomfortable being seen and heard, you know just turn off your camera and participate through the chat box. The audience will be muted during the during the program. And you, and you can be unmuted during the open discussion and question and answer session. To ask questions, enter them into the chat box. Our associates will be overseeing this to see that they are addressed by our moderator and presenters. We invite you to use the chat now to greet one another and to let us know where you're joining us from. So chime in on the chat box now. Now, I want to say something about 1882 Foundation before we get into the program, because I'm very proud of the 1882 Foundation. I, I think we made great strides and under the leadership of Ted Young, our executive director. And, uh, and 1882 Foundation is dedicated to promoting, uncovering, understanding, and sharing our American stories. We have been a regular feature in our DC AAPI community since 2012. And this is a gathering of our community, our friends, our allies, to share the stories of our lives, our history, hopes and ambitions, trials and tribulations, and our dreams. We found that the strength of our community lies in the power, the stories we share with each other in our own voices. We invite you to partner with us through your participation and support. Uh, so, uh, we have many partners and our website is 1882foundation.org. Now we have lots of partners and collaborators and if you will, co-conspirators. We have many uh, and some of the these partners are the OCA, Asian Pacific American Advocates, the Chinese American Citizens Alliance, the DC Chinatown Community Church and Service Center. And today we're especially welcome the partnership of the Association of Asian American Studies. So we thank, uh, and we also thank the building owners here, the old properties for providing this space to us so that we can have community gatherings. Now today, we are pleased to present another story of our community. We'll be hearing the origin stories, the origin story of AAPI nonprofits in DC, a look into the history and evolution of the AAPI experiences. Now, 1882 Foundation certainly fits into this category as a nonprofit organization, but we're a rather young organization established in 2011. We're happy to jump on the bandwagon of effective AAPI nonprofits on the shoulders of these earlier organizations who led the way for our community. We'll hear about much of this history from some of the real pioneers here in D.C and online. Our program was set up by one of our summer interns who will moderate the program and introduce our distinguished speakers that you've seen on the list in our flyer. So I'm gonna turn it over to Alina Lee 
She took up the challenge to produce this talk story event. And Lena is a rising junior at George Washington University, majoring in human services and social justice. Alina, the floor is yours. Thank you, Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today, whether in person or on Zoom. I'm Alina Lee, and I will be your moderator today. When I first moved to DC for university, one of our panelists here, Daphne Kwok, gave me an introduction into the AAPI nonprofits here. And in this introduction, she explained to me the process of how these large national institutions were built back in the day. And I was immediately intrigued by the stark differences between how her experiences were working with AAPI nonprofits and how my experiences are today. So I thought that this would be a amazing talk story to do with 1882, to tell the story of how these nonprofits have impacted every single AAPI and every generation over the years. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panel of esteemed guests to tell us their story. They were all a part of a social justice ecosystem that included a flow of students in and out of nonprofits groups. Some of them stayed to become board and staff members and everyone benefited from the synergies between the consciousness raised by Asian American studies and the, edu and the work from frontline leaders like themselves, even as they learned Asian American studies while producing student conferences. Phil Tajitsu Nash currently teaches the Asian, in the Asian American Studies program at the University of Maryland and serves as co-president of the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund. He has served as a Smithsonian curator, founding direct, executive director of Asian Americans Advancing Justice and advisor to AAPI groups on fundraising and internet campaign issues. Paul Igasaki was appointed by President Bill Clinton to the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, where he served as vice chair, chair, and commissioner from 1994 to 2002. Prior to the commission, Paul was the executive director of the Asian Law Caucus in San Francisco and the first Asian, the first Asian Pacific American civil rights legal organization in America. He was also a member of the National Leadership Council of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders for President Barack Obama. Karen Narasaki was appointed by Barack Obama to the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights in 2014. She also previously served as the Executive Director of Asian Americans Advancing Justice, Vice Chairwoman of the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights, Chair of the National Council of Asian Pacific Americans, and the Washington Representative for the Japanese American Citizens League. And finally, Last but not least, Daphne Kwok is currently the Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, AAPI Audience Strategy at AARP. In 2010, Daphne was appointed by President Barack Obama to serve as Chair of President Obama's Advisory Commission on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. She also served as the Executive Director of Asian and Pacific Islanders with Disabilities of California and the Angel Island Immigration Station Foundation, and she was also the longest serving executive director of OCA. Now that was just their backgrounds in a nutshell, and it definitely does not do justice to all of their accomplishments as community leaders, which we'll learn more about through our panel conversation. So I won't hold you any longer. Let's go ahead and start our panel conversation. To get to know you each some more, I would like you to share, how did you each begin your journey as community leaders in DC? Uh, Paul, would you like to start? Sure. Um, this is one of the panels where uh, uh, I may be the oldest. <laughs> I don't know. Some of, some of you are close. In any case, uh, uh, I'm a little uncomfortable with the term Asian American leader because I think when, one of the uh, principles of uh, uh, community organizing is a whole community is made up of leaders and that together we can accomplish great things individually very little. And so I think the uh, the concept of community leaders is, is something I'm a little uncomfortable with, uh, but certainly at, at the beginning of my career, I had no concept of being a leader at all. I did want to serve, to serve the community and uh, serve the needs of our society. Uh, but for me, a lot of it had to do with geography. I mean, I, I think of Daphne a lot, because a lot of us who come here to DC and spend a lot of time here, didn't grow up here. I went here on vacations. I grew up in Chicago. I was educated in Chicago up to law school. Um, and why that's important in terms of community leadership 
is the Midwest in the 60s and 70s, there was no Asian American community. There was only Japanese community, Chinese community, a few Koreans, a few Indians, but uh, mostly scattered, although Skokie, where I was, had more than most. Um, but what I found was my aunt uh, in New York, uh, June Kushino, I think Phil may have known her. Um, she and Yuri Kochiyama were buddies, which means my aunt was a radical. <laughs> and she was always sending me books, uh, Bridge Magazine, Asian American this, Asian American that. At first, I kind of ignored it. But when I was at Northwestern, uh, I was really moved by the Black Power Movement. And I saw the pride that th they were having as they organized and addressed issues. Uh, and so Asians at Northwestern just started to talk to each other when I was there, but we weren't that uh, organized. So I, I felt I had to go to California. So I went to law school where I met my wife, uh, Lou. Um, but I, I got involved in the community. We organized law students and I was inspired by the Asian Law Caucus. Um, uh, Dale Minami, Don Tamaki. Don Tamaki hired me for my first job with legal services. So, so in any case, I think what happened is we, found that being Asian American made us more powerful. If we work together and then work with other people of color and other people who are fighting uh, discrimination, uh, all of us are more powerful. So uh, uh, that's how I got to wanting to serve the community. Um, I chose to do it initially through the law. I went to law school, served with legal services for the poor. Um, but, uh, and not just Asians, but others. Uh, and that's how I got involved in this stuff. And I think what happens is opportunities come up. And one of the things for me is I was more willing to move than others. So I ended up on the EEOC because two or three people before me said, oh, I don't want to move to DC. Um, and then I, I moved uh, uh, after I worked for the mayor of Chicago uh, on Asian American issues. Um, I had been approached by the Japanese American Citizens League to come here to be their Washington rep, and that's how I got involved here. Thank you. I love that note about everybody being a leader in a community. That's very, very special. Um, how about we go to one of our panelists on Zoom? Phil, would you like to speak? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, that was very moving what Paul was saying because he he's bringing back some of the elders to us. I mean, when I came to DC, I remember Franklin Fung Chow, Juanita Tamayo Lot, uh, a bunch of people who had something they called the Pau Hana connection, which in Hawaiian just means, you know, after work, you kick back and have a drink and just talk. And that was the quote unquote old boys network that they had at the time. That was a way that we were all brought together. Like Paul said, we were from Chicago, we were from LA, we were from Hawaii. And I especially want to give a shout out to those from Hawaii, because they were really the ones who had the congressional offices. We had um, uh, the senators. We had, you know, Spark Matsunaga. We had Dan Inouye. We had uh, uh, Norma Netta, who has been a mentor to all of us over the years. Uh, we had Patsy Mink. We had all these people who had actual power. <laughs> you know, we were all on the outside. And as I've learned over the years, you need to have outsiders and insiders to get anything done. But it was so great to see the people uh, like Paul and Karen were heads of JCL, which was an established organization. Mike Masaoka and other people set it up. That was a power base here in D.C. So when some of us came down, I came down from New York. And like Paul said, he came from Chicago and, and San Francisco. It was great to have that infrastructure. And we met people like uh, Floyd Morey, uh, you know, so many people who I'd like to bring into the room here because they really were the inspiration for my generation. And we have hopefully kept some of that spirit alive with some sustainable activism. But I agree with Paul completely. Um, if you start thinking that you're a leader, you're not going to get as much done as you can. And because we are part of a social justice ecosystem and we play different roles at different times. When I think of myself, I am really Tajitsu San Namago. I am the, the grandson of Mrs. Tajitsu. That's how people looked at me at the church in New York. They 
expected certain things of me, uh, and I hope I have delivered for them in terms of participating with redress, participating in other issues. But ultimately, I think I have worked as a lawyer, I have worked as a museum curator, as a teacher. At different times in life, we do different things. And it's very important that each of us plays different roles and supports each other as we each are doing different things. And uh, it's been great working with Daphne, Karen, Paul, and so many others here um, as we've done this work. I'd also like to do a special shout out to Daphne's dad, I remember my students did an oral history of him as we were doing oral histories of local leaders. I found out that this gentleman basically built a lot of the infrastructure here in DC, you know, a Chinese American guy who wasn't just working with Chinese American or Asian Americans. He was out supporting the whole DC area. So I think that's really, uh, as I look back at your original question, you know, what is my journey as a leader? I have you know, been honored to have some leadership positions, but the main thing is I've been honored to be part of this social justice ecosystem that all of us are part of. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing that, Phil. I'm also very grateful to be part of this social justice ecosystem as a new generation. Uh, Daphne, would you like to go next? Sure. Uh, thank you. And I'm just, just listening to Paul uh, and Phil, it's like, yeah, bringing back so many great, great memories. And we were talking earlier, Paul, it's like, you know, we really have been family and, you know, over 30, 40 years, we remain very close friends. And so I think you were very fortunate that in the Asian American community, especially here in DC, it's not a large uh, community. And so we have worked together over the decades uh, and have remained uh, friends. I think one of my mottos actually has always been my play is my work and my work's my play. And I, I think, you know, I'm very fortunate that uh, my work friends have are really my personal friends and it's all interchanged, intertwined. And I think that's how we've been able to do so much over the years. But I'm extremely also extremely pleased that, you know, here I'm sitting with literally the next generation. Alina Lee. And so uh, for her to take the reins, to be interested, to really want to hear from us elders, OGs, which that term has been used a lot this week and last week, um, is really very, uh, I think, uh, enlightening for us. So how did I get involved? And as Paul said, I never thought I was going to be a leader. I never, that wasn't my life plan. You know, as I often talk about when I talk to people, it's like, uh, you would never, ever expect that Daphne Kwok uh, would become a, you know, I guess we are also public figures in a way, right? We're out there in the public because I was actually very, very shy growing up. I didn't really speak. I certainly didn't speak up in class. I hated classes that graded on class participation because I literally would get so nervous. I didn't know what I was going to say, right? I don't even know how I passed those classes. Uh, but uh, but to have been given a voice, I think, um, uh, over all these years, um, and you sort of fall into a role of leadership. And I think, as Paul said, we don't seek out to be leaders. Uh, we're just being part of the community, trying to uh, move things forward. I would say, ironically, that you know, I was just, to be frank and honest, I was just out there to have fun. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, because uh, growing up here in Annandale, Virginia, I am one of the few that actually grew up in this DC area, literally inside the Beltway, uh, you know, growing up in the 60s and 70s, it was not very diverse at all. It was grew up in basically Caucasian, uh, um, white suburb and uh, schools. And it wasn't until college, I went to Wesleyan University in Connecticut, I was thrilled that out of 600 incoming freshmen, 29 of us were Asian or Asian American. That was the largest class at that time. And to me, I thought I was in heaven. You know, I have to have 29 plus, 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 you know, the, the years ahead of us, you know, to actually be in a, the Asian American community. I was, so of course I got involved in the Asian student group, primarily to socialize, to have fun. I never realized I was actually becoming part of the movement, right? Uh, learning skills that to this day I'm using, right? Organizing skills, you know, fundraising skills, um, social movement skills, coalition building, working with African-American Hispanic students at that time. I thought we were just helping to support each other, get to know each other. But I never realized how important that coalition building at that time would be, and especially uh, translating into the work here in DC. So I sort of fell into all of this. I graduated from college with no job. Thank goodness your mother, you know, your parents have friends. <laughs> so my mom called her friend 
Pauline Sway, who's a founder of OCAW, the women's group. <laughs> Pauline, do you have a job for my daughter? She has no job. And so luckily she did. So she hired me. And that's how I sort of fell into uh, working on behalf of the Asian American community. But at that time, which is in the mid 80s, you know, there were very few organizations. There were probably less than half a dozen paid positions to work on behalf of the Asian American community. So uh, it just all, you know, flowed from there. The people I started hanging out with, Gloria Kawili got me involved in Asian Democratic Party politics. I didn't know the difference between a Democrat and Republican. I was just following along, doing what people are telling me to do. Daphne, start, you know, getting Asian Americans to vote Democratic in Virginia. Okay, sure, you know. Um, you know, and then getting involved with the organization of Chinese Americans, which we had known K.L. Wong through other family relationships and through his um, camp that he started, um, and then getting involved with the local chapter. Daphne, we need a, a board member. Can you serve on the board? Oh, yeah, sure, you know. So uh, that led to being a president of the chapter, which led to the National Board of OCA, which led to being becoming the executive director of OCA. So things sort of just fell in place. I think that if you become active in the community, you become active with groups, and that's one thing I really encourage the young people. Whatever your passion is, be involved with whatever organizations, because it's those networks that are going to prove invaluable. And so just one thing led to another. And so I feel very grateful that in all my career, uh, uh, I've been able to serve. I really do see it as serving. I have been serving the community, and certainly not for my own ego, or for my own personal advancement, but really to be able to move the Asian American community to get us on the map, especially here in DC, to get us at the tables that we have never been. And so Karen Narsaki, who's on, uh, has been my partner in crime over all these decades as well too. So, But I do have a uh, special shout out to Paul when I started at OCA. I still have the memo he wrote for me. He was a Washington DC representative and Lou was his assistant, but really new bride at that time. Uh, he gave me a, a memo saying, Daphne, this is what's happening in the Asian American community, and this is what we have to do, because we are the only two uh, Asian Americans working on behalf of the entire Asian American community in civil rights at that time in 1990 with Lou, and then I had an assistant, only four of us. I tell people this is before computers. This is before email. This is in the dark ages. And so I remain extremely grateful for Paul's guidance, mentorship, and the, and the partnership we had uh, in the beginning of my career. Thank you. That's good to know that I don't have to have everything figured out right now. Absolutely not. <laughs> um, now we'd like to turn to our last speaker who is on Zoom um, in just a second. Uh-oh. <laughs> it dropped. It dropped. Well, it's okay. I'm sure we'll figure it out. Um, no, she's still on. I just can't see them. Okay. Uh, so, okay. And she okay, Karen, do you think you could begin uh, speaking even though we can't see your video quite yet? Sure. Um, as you could see, there's a theme. Uh, we all stand really on the shoulders who, of those who came before us. I grew up in a white blue collar suburb of Seattle. My parents had moved there. There weren't that many places that Asians could live in because there's redlining against minorities in most of the city, which was fairly highly segregated. So people think the South is where all the discrimination is, but the truth is there was also a lot on the West Coast. I learned about the internment of my parents when I was in junior high at a, in a special civics class, and I was really stunned and, you know, went home and asked my parents if this was really true. Um, and they uh, burst out. They're very emotional because it was something that at the time before the redress movement, they didn't really want to talk about it. Uh, but I would hear about the discrimination that my mom faced in employment and uh, all the other challenges that were going on at the time. I was recruited uh, into Yale because uh, Donna Kanishi and other students of color had pushed the university to think more about the diversity of their students, not just racial, but also class to get more people who are from public schools, not private schools, 
uh, more people who uh, looked like the rest of America. Uh, so I was very fortunate in that. I also benefited from a minority prep program where we got to arrive a week early with a, other freshman students of color to get acclimated, uh, another program that had been created by Don, who uh, later went on to fight one of the first tenure cases at UCLA. Uh, it was very hard at the time for people of color to get tenure at major universities. And uh, he became a major figure uh, in Asian American studies. Yale was my first opportunity, like many others, uh, to learn more about the Asian American history and the current realities of the people that I met there. Uh, and to get involved in advocacy around the policies of the school. We fought for Asian American studies classes. We got a seminar or two and for an Asian American culture center that happened years after we left. To make the point that the growing Asian American student body really needed more of a home, we invited the president of Yale to a meeting where we lined up all of our shoes outside of our tiny room and he got the message. It's now on a mural on the side of the Asian American Cultural Center uh, showing some of the shoes. We work with students at Harvard and other Ivy League schools to create the East Coast uh, Asian Student Union and also hold, held the first Ikasu conference at Yale, uh, where I got to meet many of the Asian American leaders that I am honored to have worked with over my last 35 years in, the, in this work. Uh, we also work with other communities of color at Yale. In that time, we were called the Third World Coalition. This was during the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa. So there were both sort of international human rights dimensions to what I was able to learn in college. I chose law as a profession because I wanted to have skills that I could use in the community. Uh, when I had asked my dad, how could this an interment happen in the United States. And he told me it was because there were not enough people there who could defend the community. Uh, and I felt it was important to make sure there were voices to make sure that that would never happen again to anyone else. I was active in women's issues at UCLA Law where I helped to organize a women's conference as well as of course the uh, Asian Pacific Islander Law Student Association. Uh, I then went into a judicial clerkship. Again, it was a firm of action uh, because the Ninth Circuit judge had already hired two white guys and he really wanted to have a woman. Uh, and my, I was fortunate that the dean at the law school was a woman and she recommended me uh, to him. I didn't even know what a judicial clerkship was, wasn't looking for one, uh, but it proved to be a very seminal experience uh, to all of my work. Um, and then I went into a private law firm in Seattle where I actually worked on corporate law. It helped me to pay for my Yale and UCLA loans. And uh, during that time, I became active in NAPABA, which was just being created. Uh, I co-chaired their civil rights committee and worked on an anti-Asian violence handbook with the National Network Against Anti-Asian Violence that we had founded with many other leaders, uh, primarily from New York and California. After there was a series of very high profile murders in California, Washington and Florida. Uh, and then Paul Igasaki recruited me to JCL uh, to be their civil rights lobbyist in DC. He lied to me at the time <laughs> about what kind of resources there were. Uh, I had to negotiate as part of my salary a copy and fax machine <laughs> uh, in order to do the work. And that's why I that was one of the things, uh, reasons why uh, we became fast friends with OCA. We later moved our offices together. We actually wanted to have uh, one big office, but at the time our two organizations uh, didn't want to do that. So instead, uh, Daphne and I moved our, our offices together uh, and she got the benefit of, of JACL's uh, up-to-date copy machine and fax machine. So that was the beginning of my story. <laughs> Partnership coalition building. Yes, it was the epitome of leveraging resources. 
<laughs> well, thank you so much, Karen, for sharing your journey as a community leader. Speaking of what the office looked like back when you guys were leading these organizations, today API nonprofits are have a large national footprint. I mean, we saw that just in the past few weeks celebrating OCA's 50th anniversary. And as a young professional, to see so many people at these events and to be able to connect and network with so many people was really amazing. But I can imagine that this didn't always look this way. So can one or two of you, um, I think Paul, you volunteered, can you paint us a quick picture of what community organizing and advancing the rights of AANHPIs looked like for you? Sure. Um, I, I think Daphne mentioned that since she was here uh, since birth, actually, uh, that, that there have been Asian American people and Asian Americans involved in, on the Hill and government, media, uh, but not very organized. And back then, uh, the concept of Asian American was very new and very big on the West Coast. That's why I went out there, but not so much in the Midwest or East Coast. So um, JCL has been here, uh, well, it was formed in the 1920s. And my grandfather was one of those who helped found it. And uh, uh, then the war happened, which meant that they had to have a presence here. So JCL, uh, I arrived in 1989, but JCL had been here long before, although usually it's like, one staff person, uh, occasionally uh, forcing their spouse to work too, at least with Lou, we make sure they paid her. Uh, but uh, in any case, uh, I got here and the JCL people left. There was a group called Edu Legislative Education Committee that worked on redress only. They had staff people who were leaving as I arrived. Uh, and then OCA was there, and Melinda E was the director when I first got there, and then shortly after uh, Daphne took over, uh, both of us, our groups were seriously understaffed. And so what that meant was, when we went on the Hill, um, oftentimes we got calls from Vietnamese. And, you know, Melinda and I worked on uh, this uh, uh, enforcement of uh, laws keeping Vietnamese fishermen off their boats. And we worked on that with Normanetta. Um, OCA and JCL worked very closely together. And we were linked up with the Leadership Conference of Civil Rights. So that's this coalition that's been in existence since the 50s. And OCA uh, and JCL have been longtime members of, of that coalition. They helped us in a lot of things. Well, JCL was one of the founders of LCCR yes, too. Yes, and so you know, that existed. But just so you know, some things don't change. One of the issues I worked on when I was brand new, there was a right-wing congressman from Southern California named Dana Rohrabacher. He issued an innocuous bill on Asian American, fighting for civil rights for Asian Americans. Why a conservative Republican would show interest in civil rights for the first time kind of surprised us. It was a Trojan horse to attack affirmative action. And so JCL decided we're going to oppose this. I think OCA did too. And so I started going on the Hill saying, look, this is not for Asian Americans. This is for somebody else. But we're in solidarity with our, our uh, uh, with women and people of color who want to advance diversity. Um, and I remember uh, Congressman Warbacher assigned people to follow me around on the Hill to see who I met with. Uh, and we went out of our way to uh, 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 I oftentimes in the civil rights stuff was told to go after Pat Psyche because she was a Republican from Hawaii, a moderate Republican from Hawaii. And as now, uh, you have the Dem Democrats with you usually on civil rights, uh, on immigration rights, very few Republicans. And so as an Asian Republican, I spent a lot of time with, with Pat Psyche. And we were able to swing her over uh, with the help of uh, YWCA and Honolulu and uh, uh, um, and other groups. But I mean, that's, in some ways, things have, have changed radically. There were no groups. The groups that were there were understaffed, uh, no infrastructure behind us, struggling, uh, a lot of spirit. Uh, but, uh, um, but the issues are very similar. I mean, discrimination uh, changes but it doesn't go away so easily. So um, for those who want to be involved in something new and exciting, it still is. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. It is, it's a great 
opportunity to be able to learn about the evolution and see all of the positive changes that have been made throughout the years, um, but also to be reminded that there's still work to do, that we're still fighting the same issues. And I think that's what motivates me and a lot of people in my generation, that our work is nowhere near being done. Um, and in your experience, uh, Paul, Daphne, and Karen, you have all played an important role representing AAPIs in government. Can you tell us about that experience and how it impacted your work with AAPI nonprofits? Yeah, sure. I think um, I've been in and out of government and nonprofits. Uh, and after a while, I got to the point where I was getting political appointments. So they won't let you stay when your party's out of power. Uh, so I would go out and do uh, 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 nonprofit stuff in between. So uh, uh, what I found with government, and in the end, uh, just personally, I liked working in government. Uh, you, you have some power. You're doing something for the entire country, and you have a certain area of responsibility, and you can make decisions. So that really is something that I found. I'm a very pragmatic person, and so uh, I was very progressive, but yelling outside and getting shot, shouted down was frustrating to me. To get into government and have the chance to, I was never a legislator, but uh, 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 in government, be able to change a program, propose a new program, or more importantly for Asian Americans, to have an Asian American at a table that we were never at before. So we're at, at just adding our point of view. So that's uh, the difference between government and uh, uh, nonprofits. You go to work at JCL, for example, you work on all the civil rights issues that JCL decides to take on. You work in coalition with LCCR and OCA and now a host of other organizations. That's very exciting. Frankly, you lose over half the time. Uh, in government, you can have that impact, but there are a lot of stuff you can't do. And a lot of things that are out, out of your, your purview. And sometimes, uh, well, most of the time, the people you're serving are not even Asian. And there are a variety of government other groups um and that's satisfying too so uh i think those are the differences i mean the thing that 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 is frustrating if you're a, if you're a uh uh career uh, uh government worker is that you have to stay out of politics yet as we know the policies are driven by politics so as a nonprofit, you can't exactly do the politics either but um politics obviously affects that. And that's why as a political appointee, I think it maximized for me my ability to change things because I was part of a policy or a party that was a little more open to our issues. Not always, but that more than the other one. Anyway, so I think that government um, to me is uh, uh, exciting and uh, 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 rewarding. Uh, you can have more impact but uh, there's a certain satisfaction you, you make when you're working in your community and working with, uh, on things that have to do with your parents, your children. Uh, uh, that, so I think it's a, uh, both of those have a value and peculiarly for my situation, I'm able to bounce back and forth in between. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your experiences. Carrie, would you like to go next? Sure. Uh... When I was appointed to the Civil Rights Commission, uh, people wondered why I would accept it. At that time, it had suffered uh, through a lot of different kinds of leadership. It's an independent commission, and no one party controls all of the appointees. There's eight. And so uh, sometimes it was four, four progressive versus conservative, and it would be deadlocked. and not be able to move. Sometimes it was controlled by conservatives who would put out reports uh, that were pretty horrific. Uh, for example, you know, attacking Native Hawaiian sovereignty. Um, and so by, by the time uh, that Obama was president, uh, the civil rights community had been boycotting it for many, many years to the extent that their staff didn't even know who the Civil Rights Commission was, nor did most of the people in Congress, because it really hadn't been serving its purpose, which is to shed light and to collect analysis 
to examine what are the issues of the day and to make recommendations about what Congress and the administration can do about it. The reason I said yes was because when I first started in Washington, uh, Phil had talked about some of the, the OGs who were here when we started, Juanita and others who were inside government. Uh, and there was an Asian American staff uh, who was not a high level staff, but he was in the East Coast region. And he pushed the commission to first do a report on anti-Asian violence and then do a full report that was on the state of civil rights for Asian Americans. Uh, and it was a seminal report and it became the basis for much of our lobbying because here we had an independent government agency saying what we were saying about how critical it was for Asian Americans to have a voice. And uh, it was the root of being able to get the White House Initiative on Asian American and Pacific Islanders, where, which um, uh, you know has become really important to the infrastructure of making sure that agencies actually serve the Asian American Pacific Islander community to make sure that they uh, get money out to our communities uh, and that they address the language minority issues that are one of the big barriers to economic advancement for our community. Uh, so as Paul says, you know, when you're uh, outside, uh, there's a lot more freedom to say what you think and work on what you, whatever you want to work on. But in, in government, uh, you can make a huge difference that you might not necessarily be able to make in your nonprofit. Uh, I recommend that everyone who's seriously interested in policy, whether it's policy at the national level or at the local level, uh, do some work either on the Hill or in uh, an agency, because it will make you a better advocate, even if you don't make that your lifetime career, because you will understand how things work inside. You will understand the language that you need to speak and what the limitations are that are facing the people who are in the agency. And you will also build a broader network. Uh, Paul mentioned the inside outside game. And you have that because you have relationships of trust uh, between people who are in government and who are not. And the biggest thing about having Asians in the government is advocates outside don't have to waste their time educating this person, hopefully, about their own community or about the issues. They can get right to focusing on how do you address them. And you're much more likely to have someone who's willing to make it their top priority and negotiate whatever they have to negotiate in order to get it, as opposed to someone who has you know five priorities and you're number 10. <laughs> so. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. It's important to remember that, I mean, governments and nonprofits, they work hand in hand to make change, but also even as a professional to have experience in both fields can help you and your professional development and leading and making more change in the future. Um, Daphne, would you like to finish it off? Sure, I'll just uh, quickly wrap up. I'll, I'll follow up with what Karen just left off with um, and answering your question from two different angles. One is the importance of having our AANHPIs uh, in the government, you know, whether they're a career or appointed. Um, we can't tell you uh, how important it is also to have people throughout all different uh, agencies, not necessarily just in the civil rights. Well, that is very important, but it, you never know what issues are gonna come up and where we're gonna need our people. Um, I've often said that it doesn't help us to have AAPIs appointed who are not committed to the community, and then they're seen as an AAPI appointee uh, if they don't really care about our community, because then to us, that's not going to be helpful. And so that's why it's so critical that uh, for those uh, that are committed to community and willing to serve, that you do get served if you're asked, because Karen and I have been, and Paul, you know, over the years, uh, we have been part of those um, uh, political appointee processes where we're searching for Asian Americans to serve, where there is actually a position that is available. And this is part of coalition work that there is trading going on within our Black, Hispanic colleagues. You know, uh, you know, I will give you this position if we can take that position, right? But then we have to identify people uh, from the API commission, committee community who would be willing to serve. And, and time and time again throughout the years, we got turned over 
turned down over and over again because people were not willing to sacrifice financially to come to DC for like two years. On average, these appointments are about two years. We're not willing to come financially to serve. We're not willing to come to DC to live for two years and blah, blah, blah. You know, I think we have as a community to learn to be not, we have to be selfless. We need to serve. Uh, and the difference that people can make inside is tremendous. So that it was a huge learning. And I hope that over the decades that we have gotten more of our community members to understand the per importance of it, if you are tasked and invited to serve that you actually accept uh, because it can make a tremendous difference. I would say too that uh, absolutely for us to be and have the position to serve, I was uh, the honor of my life, right? In the work that I'm doing to serve the Asian communities, to serve a president, not just any president, but to serve the first black president, President Obama, to chair his commission on Asian Americans was truly the highlight of my career. But more importantly is that going out into community, representing the president, representing the White House, representing the administration, we would hear over and over again, uh, oh, thank you so much for bringing Washington DC to us, right? And especially at that time, I was living in San Francisco, meeting with the Southeast Asian community, being able to hear from them, how grateful they were to have a representative of the administration to listen, just to listen. The pure act of meeting, giving two hours, three hours of your time to listen to their concerns, to take their concerns and report it back to DC. What, How impactful just that act is. And so we need to do a lot more of that. As we know, our communities are all over the country and not just based here in DC, uh, but we have that role and it is a very important role we play. Absolutely, thank you. Um, going back to one of your best moments, your most memorable moment working at or with an AAPI nonprofit, could each of you quickly share just one memory that you had that really has stuck with you throughout your lifetime? Phil, would you like to start? Uh, yes. Um, before I start, though, let me just uh, send a shout out to Karen, because I didn't realize she was part of the cohort at Yale that got a course started that I was able to teach in 1985, years after she had left. And that shows the long-term spectrum of justice of how these things happen. And I won't get into the details or anything, but we are all tied together in so many different ways. And the effort that you take, in her case as an undergraduate, does have an impact years later. And obviously my teaching there for two years had an impact on another generation of students who have gone on to do good things. But for me, the, uh, moment that really stands out was when I was working as an academic. And we need to see our academic brothers, sisters, and relatives as being part of this nonprofit mindset, because many people working as teachers do not make a lot of money. Uh, I've worked as a law professor at the City University of New York, and then I worked here at Georgetown Law when I came down here. But mostly I've been working in Asian American studies uh, at uh, Yale and City College of New York, and then I helped to start the program here at the University of Maryland. And what happened was the University of Maryland had a synergistic relationship with Asian American LEAD, um, which is a group that started out helping refugees and immigrants of the Southeast Asian community. And we grew up together. And that moment of sharing, having my students go over there and work as interns and mentors, and us going there and learning from them about what were the real issues affecting these communities. I remember going to visit the homes where some of these people were living and seeing the terrible conditions they were living under, taking my students with me. And it's like Daphne was saying, you know, you have to help students and younger people understand the real issues facing our community because if you have privilege, if you have accomplishment, that's wonderful. But if you have those things without empathy, without compassion, then we don't need you. We need people who have all of those things because that's what it takes to be a leader and a person who really does serve the community. So that moment of synergy between Asian American studies at University of Maryland and Asian American lead is something I will never forget. And in fact, it's going to be a part of a film that John Osaki is going to be producing next year about that synergy of the campus and the community. Um, and one last thing, I just want to give a shout out to uh, Pavan Dingra and the Association for American, Asian American Studies and thank them for co-sponsoring this. Thank you. I will definitely make sure to uh, keep out for that documentary coming out. 
Um, Daphne, would you like to go next? Okay, my most memorable uh, incident happened probably when I was within my first year at OCA. As Paul said, we are very, 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 very poor nonprofit organizations. We had a fax machine. <laughs> and um, one day I walked into the office and it wasn't there. It was stolen. And so I called the police. And so I reported that our fax machine was stolen. But I was so excited because that meant we had to spend money to buy a new fax machine, right? I was so thrilled because that was like the thermal paper thing, you know, this was in the 90s, right? The next day, I opened the door. There's a police officer there. He goes, is this yours? And I, I didn't know, should I lie? Should I lie to a police officer and say, oh, no, that's not my fax machine. No, 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 no. Because I really wanted and I needed that new fax machine. But then I had to say, uh, yes, that's mine. It was so bad that the person who robbed it couldn't even pawn it off. That, that's a highlight of my OC thing. So that shows real poverty and uh, the dilemma. Should you lie to a police officer or should you not? Maybe if I if I liked him, I would never become chair of the president's commission. Oh. <laughs> well, good for the thief then. <laughs> yeah, that's a great. I mean, that shows you how. I mean, so that's why it's so important that people support the nonprofit organizations. Fundraising, we you know, it's so hard to raise money. Money's not coming from corporates. It's not coming from the public sector. It's not coming from philanthropy. We need individuals to support all of our Asian American nonprofits. As someone said, every day if you spend $7 for a Starbucks cup, you can imagine if you put that money towards supporting any one of the Asian American nonprofits, it would make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And as you worked in the same era, I would say, how was your experience? What was your most memorable moment? Well, I'm going to name two things. They, they represent the two opposite uh, kind of uh, memorable things. One was when I was a legal aid lawyer in Sacramento. And a Vietnamese American woman uh, who was in a mixed marriage and was uh, facing domestic violence. And so I really wanted to represent her. Her language abilities were limited. She worked in a cannery because she worked in a cannery. She's a few dollars over that cutoff for what I could represent her. So I said, look, come over on my lunch hours and I'll teach you to represent yourself. And so we worked on that and we worked on that and then she went to court and she hit it out of the park. She uh, uh, told her story and in the end, her, her husband was scared and the police had, had him escorted out and all that. That was for me, one of the best uh, uh, satisfaction I had because doing a lot of domestic violence prevention work, most often I wasn't able to help or they went back. This is a woman who empowered herself. She became a paralegal later on. So that that's ideally what community organizing is all about. But the biggest issue for me has been justice for Japanese Americans. That's why I came here to DC at first. I had done that kind of work in California and in Illinois, never thinking we're going to win. We won. I came to DC and there was no money. So my job was to go, among other things, was to go every year and lobby and say, please, please give us money. And the first couple of years were not going so well. We got some money, a start, but we were struggling. So later that, uh, uh, one of the times the JCL president was in town. So I took him around. Of course, we took him to meet Danny Noy. And Danny Noy was like uh, uh, the lion of the Senate and uh, very, very powerful, but he hadn't done a lot of you know, uh, redress. Norm Mineta, Bob Matsui, Spark Matsunaga did much, much more. But we were standing on him and uh, uh, Dan knowing power said, don't you think this should be a, an entitlement? An entitlement being like social security, something that you earn uh, and that, that the payment is just paid. And we say, yeah, but this is uh, post Reagan. You know, everyone hates entitlements. Said, so, well, you know, if, if you a young man, he would say that to us, uh, 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 would ask me, I would think I could look into it. And I said, okay. And we said, go ahead on. We went back to Norman, who was our quarterback, said, there's no way this is going to happen. And Bob Matsui said the same thing. And then he said, 
But Big okay. Man says we're going to do it. And they go, I guess we can. And we could. It didn't happen under my tenure. It happened under Karen's tenure that they actually got it. But uh, it me meant that uh, our parents' uh, generation, many of them lived to see the redress. If we had not had an entitlement, probably most of them wouldn't have. So uh, uh, that was probably the most impactful moment uh, that I had here in DC. Wow. Yeah, it really shows just the smallest thing that you do can really turn into something very yeah. impactful um, for the community. And, and the woman who became a paralegal, that's amazing. And to have that impact is, must be very fulfilling for you. Uh, Karen, would you like to give us your answer? Uh, sure. I, I will say that is a lesson in uh, that I learned early on is always be kind to everyone you meet because you don't know <laughs> everyone actually has an important role in the ecosystem. Um, there were so many moments, but for me, what really stands out is when I was the Washington rep for JCL uh, the second year we had a very powerful and passionate debate on same-sex marriage at the JCL National Convention in Salt Lake City. It was an issue that had been raised by the Honolulu chapter. So it shows the, inner, the importance of the grassroots groups who were pushing on this issue. Uh, now we were in Salt Lake City, which is the home of the Mormon temple. And obviously religious concerns were being raised. Others were saying LGBTQ rights were not a Japanese American issue. So we had JCL members and staff coming out on the floor of the conference during the debate to their families and to the other members as gay. We had grandmothers coming up to talk about how they came thinking that they were against it and in fact were carrying votes against it from their home chapters but they were now thinking about how they would want their grandchildren to be happy no matter you know, what uh, preference they had. It was one of the most thoughtful discussion of what it means to be a civil rights organization that I feel I've ever been a part of. Uh, Congressman Norman Mineta gave an uh, important speech reminding JSL members of how Congressman Barney Frank had moved redress out of his committee because he understood as a gay man the importance of civil liberties and how it feels to be targeted by the federal government because of who you are. At the time, you could not work in the federal government because you're considered a national security risk simply because you were gay. Uh, in part because of the bravery of those who came out of the closet that day and the fact that Norm came out in full-throated support, same-sex marriage won by a handful of votes, and JSL became the first major civil rights group in support before it became popularly known as marriage equality. We lost some members, but we also gained some members. Norm lost some contributors to his campaign. But he told those who came up to criticize him after the vote that you should only run for office if there's some things that you're willing to lose an election over. And uh, that to me epitomized the man, but also epitomized what Washington DC can be when people who serve are serving because of the values they hold and not just for their own glory. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. That's a great sentiment for us all to hold on to after this panel, um, and especially for the future generation to continue to work with in mind. Um, as we are nearing the end of our time, I'm going to jump to our last question about um, the future generation. We've talked a lot about your work during the time and the challenges you have faced, the memorable moments that um, experience that you have had that have really stuck with you. How can the younger generation continue this fight that you guys have paved the way for? What advice do you have for us going forward? Uh, Paul, would you like to start? Sure. Um, well, since I have a daughter now who's uh, um, actually approaching 30, but uh, uh, she... Uh, really? Yeah, yeah. Oh, my goodness. She's 28 this summer. So and so she's... Uh, uh, 
she always tells me that uh, uh, she thinks I'm way too conservative, which is funny because <laughs> in the community, I get totally the opposite re yeah. reaction. But uh, uh, I'm inspired by the fact that she has values that I respect. I think uh, many young people do. I, I, I find the young generation coming in, into and out of college these days, many have the spirit that, that, that existed in the 70s uh, in my generation. So I think that's, it's there. Just the other thing I would say is be inspired by people. Um, I think about people over my career who I've interacted with, who gave me advice and made me really believe in, in things. There's a, a man named Congressman Abner Mikva. He passed away after being White House Consul. But I worked in his campaigns and uh, uh, the war was still going on. I wasn't very happy with the way things were going with politics. And uh, I went to some demonstrations that you can do that. So, but if you don't engage in politics, you will lose. Get involved in politics, stay involved in politics, and you can win. And he was fighting for handgun elimination at that point in his career. So uh, the issues, we don't always want win decisively on the issues, but we make progress. I think about uh, people like Harold Washington, first black mayor of Chicago, who hired me. I didn't even support him in the primary, but he, he brought me into his administration and he gave my community more opportunities than we had ever had before. Uh, when before, frankly, the white folks were telling us, don't work with the black people, they, they don't have any power. Once he came to power, our community grew. Chinatown broke out of its bounds and developed all over the South Side. Um, so he inspired me, although he passed away and we lost the mayor's office. Uh, finally, the, the the third person uh, I wanted to mention who expired, inspired me was also He was a uh, director of California Rural Legal Assistance. He took on uh, Ronald Reagan, who was governor, and was able to get rights for farm workers. And that's why Ronald Reagan hated legal services. And then uh, uh, Cruz went on the California uh, Court of Appeal. And uh, I applied to be a clerk as I was getting out of the LRB and uh, uh, California uh, labor issues. Uh, and he called me over. I said, oh, I'm going to get this clerkship. So now I filled my clerkships. But I look at your, look at your uh, uh, resume. You shouldn't be going to a government agency yet. Go serve the poor. Go serve the least powerful. And then after you do that for a few years, you can do whatever you want because you'll be the better for it. And that's the kind of thing I would say to young people today. Depending on who you are and what excites you and what you're good at, find a way to make a difference. Find a way uh, to fight the hardest fights uh, and find people who will make you believe that you can overcome, even though it doesn't look so good sometimes. So I think inspiration is something that, that keeps us all going. Um, I think things have gotten better for civil rights over most of my life. The Trump years gave me something totally else entirely. And now my inspiration is my daughter's generation, you, people who will be there beyond us. Uh, and that's good enough for me. Thank you. I mean, we find inspiration in your generation and all the work that you have done. So. To hear that you also find inspiration us is very empowering and keeps us motivated to keep going forward. Um, how about we turn to Phil? Can you answer the question for us, please? Uh, thank you. Um, boy, it's so inspiring hearing what Paul just said because uh, I, I agree with everything he said. I remember Harold Washington, all these very inspirational people. Um, I've been teaching Asian American studies for almost 40 years now, and I can boil it all down to three concepts. We always focus on the success stories. It's easy to say we have somebody who won the gold medal in skating, the, the Nobel Prize in physics. You know, all that's wonderful. It's great to have these Asian American heritage festivals. But our history has three parts. We have the successes and contributions, but we also have the barriers. And the barriers that our parents and our grandparents, our great great grandparents, you know, going back to the 1882 restrictions that are the name of this organization sponsoring today, you know, these have been significant and they are not ending, as Paul just said. 
But the third part of Asian American history is that we have overcome by working together. We've used strategizing, we've used organizing. We're part of this social justice ecosystem that allows us to fight back and to overcome and to place people like Daphne and Karen and Paul into key places that allows us to do the good things on campus and in our small organizations. And even to have someone like Daphne at a major group uh, uh, that is distributing funds and helping develop uh, so many people who are not just Asian American. In fact, I don't really see myself as an Asian American advocate anymore. I am a human rights advocate and my agenda is simple. I don't have to say whether I support LGBT or black or anything. I just say, I want human rights for everybody. End of story. And that's meant I have pushed for marriage equality for so many other issues. But the bottom line is the we as advocates have to push for human rights for every person. And I see myself as swimming in an ocean of isms. And I'm wet. I have grown up being racist, sexist, homophobic. I've had to unlearn some of those things. But because I have developed a cultural competence toolkit to try and understand the people around me, to try to get better at communication, to be able to work in coalition with people across the spectrum of people. I think that is what has allowed me to keep going. And frankly, when people say, do you believe in CRT? Well, I was part of the cohort. Uh, I was a law professor in the 80s where we did develop you know, C CRT. And I do obviously believe it when you talk about bringing race into our discussions of law. But for me, it's not about CRT, it's about CCT making sure we have that cultural competence toolkit that allows us to learn how to work with the Latin American community, with the LGBT community, with every other person. So my main advice to younger people is become good at what you can do, you develop a career path, get a judicial clerkship, go into engineering, go into art or media studies, whatever you're doing, but develop that cultural competence toolkit so you'll be able to work with a broad range of people and fight back against the people who are trying to limit us and say, do not learn black history, do not learn LGBT history, keep trans kids out of our schools. You know, when they're saying the issue is trans kids in the bathroom, well, as George Takei, our, um, our uh, artist, our actor and civil rights advocate said, just like it wasn't ever about drinking at the water fountain, it's right now, it was never about who's going to go to the bathroom. It's about the discrimination that we are foisting upon these communities of people, whether it's the Black community, the trans community. Remember, all these things were directed against us as Asian Americans. We were prevented from practicing professions, from owning land, from, you know, you can name all these different things. Our people were lynched, our people had terrible things happen. So again, think about those successes, think about those barriers, and think about how you can be part of a strategy and a group working with people like my colleagues and friends here on this panel, and the broad range of people who are out there to bring a better world for everybody. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I hear time and time again from all of my mentors in the nonprofit space and the public sector. The best thing you can do to serve a community is to shut up and listen. <laughs> and I try to lead everything I do with that in mind. Thank you for sharing that, Phil. Uh, Karen, would you like to go next? Sure. Uh, there are a lot of things I wish I knew when I had started out on my own journey. But I, I would say one of the things that I have uh, think is the most important to understand is that whatever you do in your professional or personal life or community life, it's all about relationships. And it's about uh, really authentic relationships, not transactional relationships, not just, well, I'm here to ask you for something I want and then you know we're never speaking again. It's also about having diversity in those networks. Uh, people are surprised when I tell them that I am friends with many conservative people, not some of the more crazy ones that are out there right now. Uh, but I think it's important to really have connections with people that you don't 100% agree with because you learn something in having to defend your own position 
And sometimes there's kernels of truth uh, in the other positions that are important and can help lead you to sort of better strategies, better solutions, uh, more likelihood of success if you really understand where everyone's coming from and don't simply dismiss them because you disagree with, you know, that they're not 100% in agreement with you. Uh, I feel that it leads to a more humane working <laughs> place. Uh, uh, and a lot of what I'm sad about right now in this period is how divided we have become. Uh, when I was coming up through civil rights, and particularly the Asian community, we really focused on our differences, right? We wanted people to understand how we were different. Now I'm trying to get people to focus on how we're the same, how we have the same hopes and dreams for our families, how we have the same needs for clean water and clean air and parks for kids and seniors to be in, that there's a lot that bring us together, regardless of what our particular politics are, and then I think if we could focus a lot more on what brings us together, then we can maybe make some more progress toward building the multiracial democracy that I think most of us really envision and have been striving for. Thank you. Um, absolutely. We have power in our similarities and our cultural similarities, our experiences growing up in America, being involved in the nonprofit area and um, just within our communities. So it's definitely something that future generations should keep in mind as we continue to grow and we continue to fight for not only ourselves, but each other. Daphne, would you like to finish it off? Sure. I, I'll say that uh, I would encourage the younger generation to actually uh, hold more of these sessions with the elders, with the OGs, to really ask us for what was it like back then uh, so that uh, people can learn about, appreciate, and take that wisdom and knowledge and move it forward, move the community forward. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, even last night, you know, I'm here with David Louie, who is a veteran and pioneer in journalism, one of the first Asian American males on camera and 50 and a half years ago. Uh, but yesterday we were at the Asian American Journalists Association convention and these young journalists were coming to David and asking questions about how he maneuvered his career, you know, within the last 50 years so that they can learn and hopefully be able to advance much faster uh, as well, too. So I, I really hope people uh, will reach out to our elders before it's too late, right, and really get to document uh, the history, uh, the knowledge. Uh, because all of us have been part of Asian American Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander history, and we need to document that history now before it's too late. Thank you. That's exactly what we're trying to do here today at 1882 Foundation. So I got your next assignment already. <laughs> all right. Well, I'm locked in now. I can't go back. That's right. Since we're late, she can't say no to me, right? <laughs> nope. <laughs> Well, thank you all so much for being here today. I know this was just a snippet of the story, of your stories, and I hope that we can continue to hear from you and continue to document this important history, um, especially not only to just recognize the growth that has happened, um, but also to learn from and to learn how to continue this fight and to make more growth um, in years to come. So thank you thank again. You for all of you being here. I'd like to turn over the closing remarks to our executive director, Ted Gong. That wasn't, wasn't quite sure what the OG was we were referring to, <laughs> but the old guard. <laughs> anyway, but what is really great is also want to point out that uh, that conversation between the generations is so, so important. And I am, I have, been so inspired by people like, uh, uh, you know, the uh, all, all the interns that have come in here to, with us today. And so I want to give a, a shout, let's give a shout out to uh, Elena, Elena Lee. Uh, we also have uh, Gabby and we also have Hannah here. Amanda. And, Amanda. 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 And a bunch of other people, we have nine. Uh, interns. This year is very active, and each year the cohort gets better. And as you can see, the evidence is here how articulate, how organized you guys all are. So let's give it a shout out. 
so uh, what we do like to do is we like to sort of break up a little bit at, toward the end and allow people to have a chance to sort of co-mingle and do things together. Uh, and so we're going to do that. But before we go further, I just want to say that we have another event tomorrow. Uh, so this is very interesting. We have a double header this weekend. So tomorrow, Sunday at this time in this place, we're going to have a Jeffrey, uh, Jeffrey U. Warren come here and talk to us about visualization of loss and uh, disappeared spaces. It's going to be very, very interesting. Uh, he is the uh, creative uh, innovator, and innovator in residence at the Library of Congress. He's been trained in art and uh, he's an art trained architect, uh, artist, and it's going to be a very exciting program. I think uh, we were talking about just before here where you actually look at lost spaces or 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 sacred spaces, whether they're Chinatowns towns that disappeared or Japan towns or these places. And how do you revisualize that by using uh, old images and replicating them through uh, 3D images and so forth like this? And that's going to have a big impact on how we talk about how we curate museums, how we develop the networking and interactions to preserve those stories that we find so important. Not only do we remember, try to remember the stories, we're trying to experience the actual, uh, the actual uh, uh, events and things of the sort. So we have that coming up tomorrow. We have a, uh, we have a Chinese American Women in History coming in October. Uh, Gabby is uh, one of the key organizers, so there. Make sure that you go talk to her about how we do that. It'll be the second uh, of our. Um, it'll be the second time we've done that. In 2009, we did that before as well. We also have uh, a conference in Salt Lake City on um, rural Chinatowns and hidden sites or buried sites, and so that one's turning out, shaping out to be a very interesting program. Uh, we also have coming up. Uh, uh, the uh, the uh, uh, um, actually there's a lot of things happening in Chinatown this year. It's just a coincidence. The uh, National Trust for Historic Preservation, the Past Ward Conference, that's going to be in November, and it's going to be here in Washington. And a lot of that is focused on Chinatown, so how we see it, how we preserve it, and how we how we uh, interpret it. So that's going to be something that's going to happen in October. Pay attention to that. We have uh, uh, in uh, December, December 17 is the anniversary, is the uh, December 17 is the anniversary of the Magnuson Act, which repealed the Chinese Exclusion Act. And that this year is the 80th anniversary of that event. It, this year is also the 125th anniversary of the Supreme Court decision on um, Wong Ki Mark, which is birthright citizenship. And so we're going to have a special event to, to commemorate that at the Library of Congress. That would be December 17th. So put that, pencil that into your calendar. We're also planning to have a series of webinars that would be talking about the different individual acts that made up the Chinese Exclusion Act. We often think of the Chinese Exclusion Act as a single piece of legislation, but it was, uh, you could say it started in 1790 with the National Nationality Act. And each year through 1882, the different act, every 10 years, there was something added to that immigration process that made up the total thing, which we call uh, the Chinese Exclusion Act. So we want to sort of deal with each piece. We think, I think that that's very important for us because as we see today, immigration issues that we are talking debating, whether it's birthright citizenship, which is really being serious question now, and it hasn't been for the last 60, 70, 100 years almost. And that is being questioned now. A lot of the things that we're looking to see in Texas and other places where states are trying to take over immigration, immigration rules and regulation, those things were settled law various times, but now they're coming back. And so we want to look at the laws in the past that actually dealt with these issues and how they were debated and how they were uh, it still passed despite that. And how do they recur now? I think by looking at it in a historical fashion, we will be able to better look at what's happening now and understanding the issues that are actually being debated, whether in Texas or Florida or other places like that. It's actually not, not really brand new stuff, right? 
So if we can see it in the past, it allows us to analyze it a little bit better, understand better the arguments uh, that are against it. So anyway, those are some of the things we're doing. We have a lot of other things happening in Chinatown. Uh, thanks for again for coming over here. Be sure to talk to him about what's going on here in uh, the DC and Asian American community. Richard's here talking about a lot of the things we're doing with re revitalizing, revitalizing this Chinatown and uh, urban development of this place. Uh, you know, I put out one of these cards. I was trying to figure out how do I nowadays I don't I don't want to put out little brochures anymore. <laughs> I guess what everybody's doing with cards. Pick up one of these things I put at it. I'm very proud of myself to be able to put a QR code. You know? <laughs> so you can even find the QR code and find the that place, which uh, the website, which will have a lot more information about what we're doing and the projects that we're doing. It's a really big program. I also put out a, a card like this, and somebody asked me, why is it just a blank right here? It's sort of like DC Chinatown rediscovered more than a place, our stories, our voices, our community strong. And the idea of the blank, I purposely did that because I want us to reimagine what Chinatown can be, right? Don't get stuck with uh, old stereotypes. Think about what we can really build here. The other card I put in also is a postcard that deals with a, a picture of the Summit Tunnel. And it's a postcard that says, send it somewhere. And I'm hoping that you can send it to your congressman and at the bottom, you put a couple of words there, but it basically said, why isn't the Summit Tunnel already a national monument? If you think about it, it's just criminal that it's not. And we need these uh, places uh, uh, noted and, and, and we should be proud of those things, not just as an Asian American, but for Americans that this is something that is important for us. So that uh, nomination for it to be a, a National Monument is uh, being put forth in the Department of Interior, and it would be nice if we have more people just push for it. Also, right now, you might want to talk to your congressman about appropriations. Appropriations for Asian American issues is something that uh, people don't tend to think about it, but that discussion is happening now, and that's where the difference is. If we're a government person, uh, we could actually make, a, make an impact. All right, so again, I want to thank you all for coming here today. Uh, be sure to come tomorrow uh, and then uh, all our other events and talk to our guys and tell us your stories. As Stan has probably said, we gather together to tell our stories, to share our stories, because it's in the sharing, the remembering, and the sharing of the stories that makes our community strong. So again, thank you so much, Daphne, Paul, and then Phil and Karen on the screen, and all of you guys both online and here. Thank you. Well, I'll ask questions. Uh, no, it, it's, <clears throat> I always try to make a comment in the form of a question. <laughs> but uh, I mean, my question really is, uh, I mean, it's been great to, hear the stories and to have been part of some of them uh, from uh, all of the panelists um, about being in DC as the nation's capital. But as Ted and Richard and a lot of folks here who do local work, um, you know, I think that's part of the nonprofit space also. Um, I will put Karen on blast. Um, when I interviewed to work for her um, a long, long time ago, I made the mistake of talking about the, what did I call it, Karen? The inherent disconnect between national and local organizing. And I swear it felt like she was pressing me for 20 minutes in that interview about what I meant by that. Um, I think I'm still trying to figure out what I mean by that, but um, I think that's something that is that has always been part of what I've been trying to think about as someone, you know, I always tell people like, you know, the red line that you go through goes under the Wallach House, which is, you know, an example of how people got to buy their own building, you know, and uh, the, the 50 buses that go through Mount Pleasant, you know, go through the Vietnamese community that essentially had to leave because there were no service organizations that were there for them anymore. So, I mean, I think <coughs> a question is, you know, 
how do we build better relationships between the people who come here with stars in their eyes to do stuff on the hill to be the next JCL representative and the actual communities that are here in Chinatown and in elsewhere? Um, I think the one thing that's that's useful is that, you know, I mean, those of us who come here to do things at, at the national level had to live here. So you had to choose, you live in DC, Maryland, Virginia. Um, then, you know, I was thinking I'm going back to Chicago or Northern California. My daughter was born in, in Arlington and uh, we it, she got into schools in Northern Virginia. So I was involved. And then uh, while I was staying, trying to steer, steer clear of local politics, I got involved in the Alexandria Democrats because that was my home and then we had stuff to work on. So I think part of it is uh, to know uh, that uh, people who are national advocates or government servants or whatever, uh, they are human beings living in a community. And that, that could be DC. Um, in fact, DC serves us all. You, regardless what state line you live over. Um, and I, I, I frankly think that Asian Americans, well, you see more and more involved in politics and local government. Organizationally, I think we're a little weak in DC. Uh, you know, the legal area, we had uh, the consortium that uh, Phil worked with and the Asian Law Caucus helped found. But we also have a legal resource center that delivers legal services to low-income Asians. Uh, and so that's a local thing. So I think it's important to have both. I personally think that they, you know, you have the OCA national. Right. And it does uh, great work. But I think that the OCA DC and you have Northern Virginia and stuff, I think they're very active as well. And they should be a uh, uh, maybe Stan, you can say something about how how the local operates via the, the national and how much you. Yeah, yeah, the local you know, tends to you know tend to concentrate on on, on the local issues here as opposed to national. You know, what's what's cute? What's peculiar about what's going happening to the AAPI community here look in the Washington? DMV area as opposed to national and how it should be differentiated. Yeah. You know, uh, just, 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 uh, just a side remark also, CAC, I also represent Chinese American Citizens Alliance and CACA has never had a national sort of chapter. It's always focused on the various district areas. But I think that's a mistake in the sense that if you want to have an impact, even in your local area, you're doing something in San Francisco or Los Angeles, and you want to influence things, you need to have a presence of visibility that has a national, uh, national presence about it or a national perspective. One thing also about being in Washington, especially for the historical groups like us, I don't think there is any place other than Washington that can do the historical representation that we can do in DC. DC becomes like a national center to talk about cultural issues that can't be discussed very well with regional museums and so forth like this. And so you could think about having a national Chinatown research center that is, is, that is much more encompassing and telling and, and more, more uh, influential in the terms of getting resources out to various peoples and organizations. And that can only be done in DC. Yeah, Karen. Yeah, I want to echo what Ben says. Uh, it has been my experience. I tell people there are two Washingtons. There's the official federal Washington that most of us run around in, who come into Washington to do national policy work, and then there's the local Washington, and most people don't think of the local Washington as actually having people in it, right? They just think it's the government. Uh, and the local communities have suffered as a result. People forget, Ben, what is the metro population area? It's in the top 10, I think, of metro areas in terms of Asian American population, yet it gets very little love from 
uh, philanthropy uh, or not enough love at least from philanthropy uh, or, or from uh, activists and I do think that would be helpful to have sort of a more intentional plan uh, among the national AAPA groups who have offices in DC to think a little bit more about what they could be doing to help uh, the local uh, in DC. Because to me, it's just sad that our nation's capital has among the highest or lowest levels of literacy, among the highest poverties in uh, certain parts of the city. It's incredibly segregated. Uh, and for those of us who think of ourselves as not Asian American advocates, but as Phil says, as human rights advocates, it's something that we should really all be much more engaged in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just building on what Karen and Paul and Ben and others have been saying, um, the local JACL office, for example, uh, helped to have a local elementary school named after uh, Senator Spark Matsunaga. And that was a way it got some of us who do national stuff to work locally. I, I live in Montgomery con uh, County in Maryland, and that was very helpful to me to get to meet some of the local people. And lately, I've met, uh, met people as we're working on getting Asian American history into the local curricula in Virginia and Maryland, for example. Uh, it's so good that people seen as having a national perspective also just roll up their sleeves and do local stuff. I remember that synergy back in the late 70s when I was in New York, and it was the DC people who pushed for the first Asian Pacific American Heritage Week. This was uh, Ruby Moy over at uh, Representative Frank Horton's office from New York and, and Norm Mineta's office from California, and they pushed through this APA Heritage Week. And we in New York said, what the heck is this? You know, but these people in DC had the vision and the foresight to say, start celebrating. And like I said, it's about celebrating as well as looking at the barriers and strategizing, but you got to start with some celebrating. And so DC people have led us on the local level outside of DC. But now that I've been down here for a while, I see that we can also do stuff here as advocates in the DC area. But there is a caveat. I can tell you, having curated an Asian Pacific American program for the Smithsonian back in 2012, there is a lot of division between local communities. So for example, the local Mongolian American community has people who are predominantly Russian speaking and Chinese speaking, and they didn't really work together as much until I, as a Smithsonian curator said, we're going to have a time slot for Mongolian Americans, please work together. So sometimes we who are from these national groups, from the big, um, uh, uh, you know, OCA, JCL, and other national groups, we can help these communities to come together and work together because sometimes there are animosities that are personal or that are longstanding that some people may not even remember. So um, I remember when the local Filipino Americans, I said, there are five Filipino American groups that do dance here in the DC area. And I only had a two hour slot for them to do something at the Folklife Festival. Can you please work together and put together a program? I'm not an expert. I can't choose which one of you should represent. So again, sometimes we with national uh, connections can help the local groups to work together as well. But I know it's been my privilege to work with some of these local groups and it takes time and effort. But um, it's something that we with national perspectives can help locals and then the locals help us with national perspectives to keep our feet grounded uh, here in the DC area and in other local communities. I, I do wanna give a shout out to Martha Watanabe who's in one of these pictures, the the lower, one of the lower ones uh, with Patsy Mink who has is a model of how you straddle sort of national work. She was a longtime career person at DOJ with local activity and she really leads the way. Thank you. Are there any more questions before we wrap up? Yeah, I got one. You know, maybe you don't want to answer. Probably don't want to answer it. But, but you know, you, you mentioned you know accepting government positions. You know, when you 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 name to a position or something like that, you know you should you accept it. But but you you mentioned that uh, you should always keep the, com the community in mind you know, when you take the take this assignment. Is there any person, <laughs> would you be willing to name anybody you feel like it was? No, Stan. You know, that, that didn't, 
community. Oh, you know, you had had ignored, and you had ignored the community. I think uh, I think many people. It's not politically know. correct to use the name. Yeah, but, no, there are so many people, right? And and there are some very highly visible ones. And yeah. That uh, you know, I often say, if they had used their platform to help our community, we could have been so much further ahead, right? And those individuals choose not to necessarily associate with their Asian Americanness, um, and it's it's a it's a huge loss. And yet people point to them as, well, there you have an Asian American top levels of, so, you know, what are you complaining about, right? So. You know, one thing that occurs to me about what you said is that uh, um, when I first came to town, uh, well, we were just a few of us who were involved, but uh, we noticed that during the summer, lots of Asian American students came in for internships with, with uh, companies, with the federal government, with Congress, with the White House even. Uh, and so many of them were smart from all over the country, but many of them had no clue on what issues the Asian American community was facing, what their being Asian has to do with anything they're doing up here in DC. But there were so many of them as compared to us that we decided we, we had to form an organization to deal with this. So it was Chantal Wong and Lou and I, Lin Lu, we set up a group called Kapal, and we had, uh, through the summer, we had seminars on issues aimed at Asian students who came here uh, for, for the internship, saying that, think about this, think about what your office is doing for our community, is it addressing this? Uh, maybe next time you want to work for a place that does deal with these issues, and, uh, uh, and Kapal th is thriving. Uh, they have uh, uh, scholarships, which we've never even contemplated. Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's 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 progress. No, it's funny you say that, Paul, because uh, we grant to them, right? So my office has a grant program. We mm, fund good. these local groups that yeah. you're talking about, right? Like Ava Lead and Kapal. Um, I've always honestly been a little like, well, what is Kapal doing locally, right? Like they do these programs that promote public service. Uh, they just closed their program uh, for the summer, right? They had their last session. And it occurs to me that in the same way that we do, that they do a session on Pacific Islanders, in the same way that they do a session on media representation, they should do a session with 1882, with the Wall Luck House, with AA Lee, you know, to really oh, yeah. show folks yeah. like what the local scene is. And with your city office, to yeah, the right. issues that is, issues that are going on locally. I mean, yeah, they're they're yeah. here to work on whatever, but just to know this is uh, Asian uh, DC, and this is uh, uh, something you should know if you're I living here. Require them to do that. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, or we could on the side, I strongly suggest Kapal is a uh, conference on Asian Pacific American leadership, yeah. but yeah, that's a great programming mm -hmm. recommendation. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I want to say this is not just a problem in D in the government, it's a problem in corporate leadership as well. Daphne and I have spent many decades fighting to get more Asian Americans on corporate boards, only to sometimes they finally put an Asian American on a corporate board who then won't even meet with us, even though we're the reason they're there. So uh, there's work in every part of, of uh, American society that we need to do better at. Yeah, and building what Karen just said, I've been speaking a lot to these employee uh, Asian affinity groups at various corporations, and it's fascinating to talk to people who are engineers, who are, you know, people who don't really get involved with Asian American stuff. Maybe they just go to an Obon festival in August, or they do, you know, uh, Dragon Boat Festival, or, you know, they just do some things. But when they invite people like us, you know, the people here on this panel or others, we come in and talk about the broader range of civil rights issues, talk about the history and say, every one of us has an obligation to spend some part of your career and your life helping other people. You have certain privilege, you have certain, you know, things that came because of your skills uh, and your background, your connections, but what are you going to give back? And so, um, that is another synergy that we can have, those of us who can get out and speak, not just to student groups, not just to Kapal, which has done a wonderful group, but also get into these corporate affinity groups and 
remind them, you know, it's not just about the success. It's about the barriers and the strategies we use to overcome them. Do you only uh, uh, the final word on because I'm closing this thing out. <laughs> One thing is look at the staffers, right? The senior staffing in the Congress, how many Asians are actually in those places? Well, I think we should put more attention and building up people's interests and actually get them into senior positions. It's the staffers that actually make some of actually make some of the laws and things that work. So again, I want to thank all of you for being here and especially all our guests and all the organizers of the program. Thank you so much.